on this computer. Very good. So today we're going to be still in the prologue of the Gospel of John. It's only 18 verses, and today we're only going to make it through like two more because this is some deep stuff. But we're going to spend some time on it um, because it's worth it. It's worth it to really understand the meat of what John is getting into here. And John loves to use language that is dense. It, it really captures big ideas, but in short words. And so we're going to spend some extra time on that. And before we dive in, how about I'll pray, and then we'll do some more reading, and then we'll get into what he's talking about. Okay? All right, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God. You work in ways that we don't expect, in ways that we cannot accomplish under our own strength. Um, you work miraculously, and you work through means, meaning that oftentimes you work through humans. You work through us. And Lord, I, I pray that you would work through us today, that you would instill in our hearts a desire and an ability to understand Scripture, so that as we read these words, they wouldn't just bounce off of our minds, that we wouldn't be lost and confused uh, because the flesh cannot understand things of the spirit, but instead that your spirit would illuminate our minds so that we can understand it. Lord, we, we trust in your promises that when you promise to help us in that way, that you come through for us. You are a covenant keeping, promise keeping God. You are always faithful, even when we are not. And we trust you in that. And we're going to rely on that today. Lord, we thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right, so keep your microphones unmuted because we're going to do some reading. I'm going to call on you individually. I see um, five of us, and we've got 18 verses, so we'll just read three at a time. And Matt, if you'll read verses one through three, we're going to go all the way through 18 so we get the full context, and then we're going to dive down into the little bit we're going to talk about today. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Very good. Katie, can you do four through six? In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man... Oh, sh sorry, should I read that one too? Yes, four through six. Perfect. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. I read too much. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Alyssa, then will you read eight and nine? Mm -hmm. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Very good. Lauren, can you read 10 through 12, please? He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that, go ahead and finish that sentence. Go ahead and read 13 too. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of nor the will of man, but of God. Okay. And because I can't count, then I'll read the last four verses, because math is hard. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So last week uh, we started by talking about a guy named John. It picked up in verse um, 6. And now which John is this? Is this John the Apostle or John the Baptist? Baptist. This is John the Baptist. We call him that because sometimes he's called John the Baptizer. He's not like the first Southern Baptist. He just baptized a lot of people. It, it was his job, his role to come as a front runner 
for Jesus. He was related to Jesus. They were cousins. And, um, and his job, as he puts it in, later in chapter one, was to make the path straight for Christ to come in. And the way he was doing that was to turn the hearts of Israel back to God to repent of their sin and turn back to God. And as a sign of repentance, they were baptized. When they were baptized, it was not a means of conferring grace on them or a means by which they were saved or forgiven. It was as a sign of the repentance that I'm doing, I'm gonna be baptized as a public sign of that. And so um, this word repentance, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with the word repentance, repentance is a turning. When you repent, you're headed one way, and you turn around, and you go another way. So repentance is not just, I've been doing these things that are sin, and I'm going to stop. It's, I'm going to start doing the things that are good that God's commanded me to do instead, and I'm going to do those instead. It's, it's, not a, it's not a whole list of don'ts. It's a list of do's to replace the don'ts. That we're, we're, We've been headed in the wrong direction. We're going to make a new turn and go the right way. And that's what he was calling them to do. And it talks about how in verse 7, he came as a witness. Now, this witness was a particular kind of term. Do you remember what kind of term this was? How, what's the context in which he's using the word witness there? I know somebody as, took notes. As, as a legal term? As a legal term. Very good. This is a legal term. He's building a case. He's saying that John came to stand on the witness stand and say, this man is the Christ Christ. That's who you need to look to. Now, then we talked about how the true light gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. And this idea of gives light to everyone, we could misconstrue and end up, if we took it out of context, we could end up at something called universalism. Universalism is... Um, it, it, if you, and if you spent any time in Christian circles, you may hear the term saved by works versus being saved by faith. And we're going to talk some more about that soon. But universalism is really being saved by death. In other words, the only thing that it takes for you to get into heaven is to die. That's universalism. That means that every man, woman, and child on this earth, no matter how much they've rejected God their entire life, even from conception, if they die, God will just go, eh, no big deal, come to heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible says about it. And so we can't land on universalism. This is, this is a non-biblical concept. So when it says God, that Christ gives light to everyone coming into the world, he clarifies it in verse 10. He was in the world. The world was made through him. We read about that in Romans, that the world was made in order to display the attributes of God to reflect his glory, so that when we look out at everything that's made, it should point our eyes to Christ. It should point us to God. But our hearts were darkened as a result of sin. And so as Calvin puts it, it's almost like we can, we, when we're looking around at the world, we never look up above the horizon. Our eyes never make it anywhere past that, because we're always looking down here at temporal things about the things of the world. We're looking at... Um, things that we care about because our, our hearts are darkened. That, that's referring to our desires. It says that our minds are futile, so it's referring to our thoughts. And as a result, we, we don't know God. We don't seek after God. So that's a pretty bleak picture. And then it says even that the Jews, his own people, they did not receive him. That's what it says in verse um, 11. And so we ended last week with a pretty bleak picture of when Jesus came into the world, like nobody accepted him, nobody received him. But then we get to verse 12. And I want us to reread verse 12. Um, Matt, could you reread for me verses 12 and 13? Sure. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Very good. So some did receive him. And if we look at um, the previous verses, when it says no one, and it says uh, they did not receive him, the world did not know him. These are generalizations. The world as a whole as general rejected Christ, but there were individuals who did receive him. And if we were to look at this word receive, 
this is something that you need to do. And I spelled it right because I spelled it wrong on Wednesday and I had a teacher in my class that busted me, I before E except after C. So that we need to receive him. This is something that is given to you and you have to accept it. There's a, there's a volitional concept there. In other words, you voluntarily need to take action on this. Now, uh, but what does it mean to receive Christ? What does that mean to receive Christ? I'll give believe you a hint. Oh. Go, oh, no, Katie, what were you going to say? Sorry, is it to believe in his name? It's to believe in his name. Very good. So as we continue to read that verse, to receive Christ is to believe and not just believe in any old thing, but to believe in his name. Get a capital H there. Now, his name here is representative of who he is and what his person and work are. When we talk about his name, we're talking about something that represents his identity, represents the work that he did, represents his role in, redemptive, uh, the, in the plan of redemption, his role in salvation, um, and who he is as God, even. So when we believe, though, we say a lot of things, uh, and we use this word believe, but we don't really mean what he means here. So like if you were to tell me something that I consider to be true, maybe, and I will accept it as fact, then I would say, I believe you. But that's not what it's talking about here. And we know that if we will flip to the book of James. So James is in the New Testament. If you're in John, we're going to flip to the right. You'll go John, Acts, Romans. Once you're in Romans, that's the Pauline epistles. These were letters written by Paul. After all of those is a book called Hebrews that was probably written by Paul, but we're not sure. And after Hebrews comes a little sliver of a book called James. It's short. I think it's got five chapters. James was a half-brother of Jesus. In other words, Mary was his mama. Joseph was his daddy. But Jesus' daddy was God the Father. So they're, they're half-brothers. So if we're in James, let's look in James chapter 2. In my Bible, um, and Katie, you've got my Bible. I can tell you James chapter 2 starts on page uh, 1011, page 1011. But we're going to be on 1012 because we're going to read James chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. James is having uh, sort of an a dialogue here with an opponent on the, the ideas of uh, faith versus works and salvation. And he's making a point here starting in verse 18. Is everybody with me at James chapter 2 and verse 18? Mm -hmm. All right. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. In other words, you may be saved by your faith, but look at my good works. I don't need that. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he's, he's getting into this um, argument here about how faith without works is dead. Faith, good works, true good works, are a resulting output of your salvation through faith. In other words, um, salvation is not works plus faith equals saved. Instead, it's faith equals saved plus works. That when we are converted, when we are justified, when we are transformed by the new birth that we're going to get into in a few minutes by the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to do those good works for the first time. That all of our works before that time were tainted by sin and we're out of selfish desires. So that's what he's talking about in verse 18. And then he says in verse 19, so that we understand what he means by the word faith, he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. So it has to be more than just intellectual assent. It's, when we talk about belief and faith, it's not just understanding the facts and saying, sure, uh, yeah, I think that may be true. When we talk about believing, Let's say we, we erased our receive here. So we receive him. We believe on his name. This word we should understand as meaning trust. So it's more than just believing that the chair will hold up somebody. It's actually sitting in the chair and believing that it's not going to fall. It's not just saying, 
yes, I've seen a plane fly in the sky. I believe planes can fly. It's buying a ticket and getting on the plane. So when we talk about Christ, believing in Christ is not just saying, I believe he existed or that he was a good person or a good teacher or even a martyr. It's trusting in him as the only source and way of your salvation personally. You, you believe that Jesus is the only way and that it is through him that you can be saved and you put all your trust in that. You don't put your trust in your own personal good works for that. You don't put your trust in the good works of your parents or the fact that you've got a Bible that sits on your bedstand or even tucked under your pillow to keep the demons away at night. That when you think of your relationship to God, that you are saved through Christ alone. And it's a trusting. So what is the output of this? When we receive him and the means by receiving him is to believe in his name, to trust in his name and his word. What does he give us here? in verse 12. I'm back in the book of John, so I hope you didn't lose your place. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, what does he give us as a result? The right to become children of God. Good. So my Bible says right. Um, other translations, you will see power, like a King James, the power to become children of God. These are both fine words in the context. Those are good. But this phrase here, Children of God, it is popular in, um, in our culture. Let's see if I can erase this with this little bit of eraser. It is popular in our culture to refer to all mankind, all men, women, and children born at any time as being children of God. They'll say, it's okay. God is love. We're all children of God. We all mess up. It's fine. <laughs> This idea that just by being born that you are a child of God. Now, all men, women, and children are created by God in his image. So we are all creatures of God. But the Bible does not say that we are all children of God. Instead, it says quite the opposite. Flip with me to the book of Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is not as far to the right as the book of James. In my Bible, it is on page... We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, so it's on page 976. This is Paul writing to uh, the Christians in Ephesus, which is why it's called Ephesians. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, and here he's talking in this passage about grace through faith. And he, he describes our initial condition, what we are at conception. Who, whose child are we? when we are born, when we are conceived? Are we a child of God? Or are we a child of something else? So let's read this. Um, Katie, can you read for me Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through um, 3? And then Alyssa, can you read for me after that, verses 4 through 7? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Go ahead and read three also. Oh, <laughs> I'll get You're this good. right one day. <laughs> Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. Oh, that, that's a superscript. Yeah. yeah, that's not a verse. So just keep going to the end of that sentence. Go until oh. you get a period. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the mind and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Good. Um, so Alyssa, you read uh, four through seven. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Very good. So what does the Bible describe us being as before we are made alive in Christ? What are some of the words and phrases that it uses here? 
We're dead. Dead in De- trespasses and dead. sin. Dead. Yikes. <laughs> dead in sin. All right. What else? We followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air is what my mind says, but I think Katie said something else. Very good. Now, this ruler of the kingdom of the air, or in the ESV, it says the prince of the power of the air. This is a reference to Satan. In other words, when we are born, we are by nature followers of Satan. Satan is the father of lies. By that, we represent that he, um, he does not make people sin but he represents and intentionally leads and tempts uh, non-believers and believers to sin. And that before you were made alive in Christ, by nature, you are a follower of that influence. You are a follower of Satan. So what else does it say? It uses a bunch of phrases here, all for the same thing. Children of wrath. Children of wrath. And whose wrath is this? God's wrath. This is God's wrath. Now, this is not something you're going to hear on a Sunday morning very often. We talk a lot about how God is love, but the Bible is also very clear that God is full of wrath all the time towards sin. Sin is a rejection of his law. It's a rejection of his kingship and his sovereignty over you. And he is angry all the time at that. And why do we know that he's angry all the time? So there's something that we need to know about God that helps us understand that better. God is something that we call immutable. Now, if you've ever seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the turtles touch the the radioactive waste. By the way, I used to work in the nuclear industry. It doesn't look like that. It's not green and glowing. (laughs) They touch the radioactive waste and they mutate into something else. To mutate is to change. When we say that God is immutable, we mean he is never changing. He is the same yesterday and today and forever for eternity, which means that he doesn't suffer through the waves of emotions like we do. I might be in love with somebody, and then later I might be pretty mad at them, or I might be having lots of fun with my kids, and then they do something that makes me full of wrath. Now, God does not go through these waves of emotions. He is all the time love. He is all the time angry at sin. And so here, when we're born followers of Satan, when we're born in sinful flesh, we're born by nature, rejecting God, which means we are already under his wrath. That's what it means by children of wrath. And then there was another phrase in there that I saw, sons of disobedience, which is another way of saying that we by nature disobey. We reject God. We know by the conscience, the light that he's giving us, what is right and what is wrong, and we choose to do wrong. And this sons, by the way, does not just mean boys. This means everybody. This is mankind. So um, so this says that when we receive Christ and believe in his name, we are given the right now to instead become children of God. Now, when you start out in one family and you become part of another family, what does that, what's, what's the word we use for that? Adoption. Adoption. I had a joker on Wednesday say marriage. And I said, that's not the word. I'm looking for. <laughs> he, he knew I was looking for the word adoption, but yes, adoption. And so the Bible often refers to our relationship in Christ in the new birth as being adopted into that family, that Christ is the firstborn son of many brothers and sisters, and that we are adopted into that family from outside, that, uh, that we have been given the spirit of adoption, it even says. And so to me, that when, when my Sister and brother-in-law, they can't have children on their own. They've been adopting and fostering. I've told them before, this is a wonderful picture of who we are in Christ. When we bring somebody from outside the family into ours, and we love them as dear children, that's who we are when we're in Christ. That's the position that we have with God when we're in Christ. We've, we've been made real children of God through adoption. Very good. So, um, but that's not the end of the sentence. If you flip with me back to John 1, don't ever keep, don't ever take your finger out of John 1 because we're going to be there for a long time. Back in John 1, I'm in Ephesians. That's why this doesn't work. 
back in John 1, that verse 12, he gave the right to become children of God. Does yours end with a period there? No. 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 Mine doesn't. So there's a comma. I'm going to put dot, 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 comma. And then it says, who were born. Yep. Who were born. So we're still talking about us as children of God. If you are in Christ, then it's talking about you. If you are not in Christ, then this is a call to be in Christ. And this word born here, it'll become clear in just a minute. I'm going to reread verse 13. It says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we'll just go through these one at a time. It says, not of blood. And in some translations, you'll see this plural, bloods. That's because in the Greek it's plural. And theologians have come up with all sorts of ideas for why it's plural. They all boil down to the same thing. This is referring to natural birth. In other words, this birth that is required, this birth that is part of you becoming a child of God, is not something you can do naturally. You can't be born of two Christian parents who are both saved. You can't be born saved as a result. You, you can't uh, have come from a long line of preachers, um, and then now you're, you're this preacher's grand, 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 grandkid. That doesn't make you born again either. So this is not a natural birth. The second thing that it says here is not of the will of the flesh. Now, does anybody say anything else here in a, in a different translation? Do I have any, any NIV readers? Mine says not of human decision. Not of human decision. I like how it puts that. Not of human decision. In other words, it's not up to you to be born again. It's not something that you can go, I decide today I'm going to be born again. That's not how that works either. So you can't be born into it naturally, and you can't decide on your own, of your own volition to go, I'm going to be born again today. And part of the reason for that is whenever we see this word flesh in the Bible, it's usually chained to another word called sinful. When we talk about flesh, we're talking about the natural man. We're talking about um, your first birth and that you're born into sinful flesh. So all of your thoughts and decisions and, and ideas and, and attempts, your will at birth is flawed by sin. We call that fallen because it's a result of the fall. So it's not up to natural birth and it's not up to your decisions. The third one here, not of the will of man. And Alyssa, what does yours say for that? Uh, mine says, a husband's will. Husband's will. Now, this does not mean the guy you're married to. All right. So in other words, it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean it's not up to your husband either. A husbandman is um, a very old phrase for like a gardener, somebody who goes out into the natural world and there's disorder and they create order. They're trying to influence some aspect of that. So in other words, this not of the will of man or of a husband's will, this means it's not up to others. Now, I say that because there are religions in this world that believe that you can do things in order for God to confer grace on somebody else. So in other words, you, according to the Bible, can't be baptized and that confer grace on somebody who's already passed away, or maybe they can't get into the water or for any of these reasons. Baptism, by the way, doesn't confer grace. We, we talked about that a few minutes ago. But um, this is an example of that. I can't do something that will influence or cause somebody else to be born again. So if I can't be born into it naturally, and I can't accomplish it under my own will, and other people here can't accomplish it under their will, then this being born again, I'm going to insert this here, because this is not in the, this is not in John. To be born again, this is a supernatural birth. We also know, because it's not a natural birth, that it is a spiritual birth. I'll write that down here. So we got supernatural and spiritual. 
And we're gonna learn in just a minute, let me get my notes back up, my phone keeps dying. When we flip over to a little bit later in John, we're gonna flip to another chapter that it is a sovereign birth. Remember, because it's not according to my will or others' will, it's up to God, he's king here. It's a sovereign birth. So I want you to remember these three concepts right here. When we talk about being born again, it's supernatural birth, it is a spiritual birth, and it is a sovereign birth. And in order for us to get a hint at some of those things, let's flip to John chapter three. So if we're in one, in my Bible, you just go one page over and you're in chapter three. And I want us to just read the first few verses of John chapter three. I'll read and y'all can follow along. In John chapter three, a man has come to visit Jesus. His name is Nicodemus and he is what they call a Pharisee. He is a teacher of the law in Jerusalem. In other words, he's a leader of the church, so to speak, in Jerusalem. He works in the temple. He's a member of the synagogue, which is the ruling body of the Jewish, um, of the Jews at the time. And he comes to Jesus at night. He doesn't want anybody else to see him come to Jesus because Jesus was not popular among the other Pharisees. And he comes to ask him some hard questions. So I'm going to start in verse one, John chapter three and verse one. Let me write this on my whiteboard. John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And then Jesus does not pause for any small talk. He immediately goes straight to the point of what he wants to talk to Nicodemus about. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, now, anytime Jesus says that, that means pay attention. I'm about to say something important. He says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When he uses the word cannot, this is a necessary condition. This is not an optional thing. This is a, you must do this. That is not big enough. Whoa. He says, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus is a teacher, and he's used to talking in parables. He's used to painting word pictures for people so that they can understand harder concepts. So he's not lost on this concept of being born again. But he does have a big question about it. And I feel like there's a big pause after verse 3 before Nicodemus goes, has some time to process it. And then in verse 4, he says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's not lost on the picture of being born. He's not thinking Jesus is talking nonsense. What he's lost on is this idea, this picture of using birth. When you and I were born, to everyone in this room, think about when you were born. I can't remember it, but that's a good, that's a good lead in to answer the question. How much effort did you put into the process of being conceived and being born? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. If anything, you personally made it harder, okay? I, I made it harder, I know, the cord was wrapped around my neck and there was all sorts of alarms going off during the birth process. Okay. My son made it harder. He came out and he was gray, which is the wrong color. He pinked up really fast. He had heart surgery five months later. This is a God thing. And I can tell that story later. But the point is you didn't do anything but make it harder to be born. And so Nicodemus is going, okay, if in order for me to get into heaven, I have to be born again. I can't do that. I can't be born again. God has to do that. So he asks this question. This is where I got this word sovereign, that it's, that it's a thing that God has to do, and he has to do it with his own power and by his own will. And I'll finish up before we get out by finishing this, this short passage. Jesus answers him in verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So this is something that, that happens spiritually. This is something that happens supernaturally. It's not in your flesh, and it's something that happens sovereignly. It says the Spirit goes where it pleases. So um, we're out of time today but we're going to talk some more about these concepts next week. We'll do a little bit of review on the new birth because this is, uh, this is really important doctrine on understanding what salvation looks like for a Christian. The new birth is critical. And then we'll get into one of the best really short descriptive pictures of what the gospel actually is in verse 14. It's going to be beautiful. So we'll come back next week and talk about that. Now, we've, I've gone three minutes over on time, but I still want to answer questions. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? No questions? You just don't want to make it any longer? <laughs> I get in trouble for that, for making it longer by asking questions all the time. Um, that's okay. Um, I just have a comment to make. Sure. Um, the whole... I love that we're talking about exactly what it means to be born again, because I am somebody who, like I said before, I've been going to church my entire life. And this is not talked about a lot of times and it is vital. It is like the foundation of your faith. And, and, and so few churches will talk about what it actually means to be born again. So I think it is just so awesome that um, we're breaking this down, and I think you've done an excellent job of explaining it in a Thank way you. that makes it makes sense, and it completely um, is is rooted in what John is saying here. So I think that was so good. Very good. I I was actually just typing almost word for word what she just said <laughs> in the Slack channel. Uh, I've grown up in the church. I know all the phrases. I know all, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Well, those are all phrases. So I've been struggling because, based on the fact that even the demons believe. Um, I've been struggling with the fact, okay, what is salvation? How do you become saved? And so this, uh, my church had a sermon two weeks ago that started this. This is helping more. So thank you so much. This is wonderful. Excellent. Great. Yeah, when we talk about being born again, uh, the, being a born again believer has almost been given a uh, radical. Uh, like if you if you're if you if you go around telling people I'm a born again believer, then the media has made it look like that means you're a crazy Christian person. And um, and so but this this idea of being born again is is throughout the New Testament. Uh, John talks about it. Peter talks about it. The new birth is a real thing, and it's good for us to talk about it and claim that if, if we are in Christ. Uh, it's not a, it, it, I kind of want to take it back from the, the crazy Christian vibe. You know, we, we want to take it back as it means something real, and this is what it means. So that's good. I also appreciate how you're talking about sin at the beginning, because without that, I think that's another thing that a lot of churches were afraid to talk about, or it's not popular to talk about. You don't hear about sin, but being born again outside of that context doesn't make any sense. You know, if we don't talk about the fact that we were children of wrath that we were dead in our sin, that we deserve God's wrath. Well then what, why do you need to be born again at that point? So yeah. I, I'm grateful that you're tackling that. Um, Cause you can't have the good news without the bad news. <laughs> right. Right. The good news is not, uh, smile, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That I, Everybody in the world has a wonderful plan for my life. That doesn't mean anything new to me. Um, I, the, the good news is that there's bad news and something good has come to rescue from you from that. And so we're just going to keep diving into that. This whole next uh, four verses, is, four or five verses is all about that. So that's great. It's great. Cool. Well, before we get back to work, um, Matt, can you close us in prayer? Sure. Be happy to. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you that you have revealed 
truth to us. We thank you that you have loved us even when we were children of wrath, that you sent your son to die for us and, and take the punishment that we so richly deserved. And we thank you for revealing this truth to us that we might glorify you for it. And we ask you to always be increasing our desire to learn more and know more about you, that you would truly, by your spirit, uh, light a fire in our hearts to delve into your word, uh, that we might praise you rightly and, and glorify your name. And uh, we ask that you will continue to, to bless these studies. We thank you. Uh, and I thank you for all, all the work that Scott is putting into him. And uh, I ask that you will teach us uh, by this study in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks to each of you for coming. It's been a fun time. Thanks. See you later. Thank Good you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.